Joining us now is Arnie Gunderson, a former nuclear industry senior vice president who has coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants around the country. He's currently chief engineer at Fairwinds Associates and an independent consultant on nuclear and radiation issues to the NRC, congressional and state legislatures and government agencies and officials in the United States and abroad. Welcome to Background Briefing, Arnie Gunderson. Hi, thank you for having me. And uh, the Japanese parliament have come out with a report on the Fukushima nuclear disasters saying that they were profoundly man-made disasters, that they could have been foreseen, could have and should have been foreseen and prevented and mitigated by more effective human response. Pretty strong uh, condemnation for a country with a government that's pretty much been in bed with the nuclear industry. It it really was. Uh, It amazes me that uh, they were so forthright in their assessment. You know, it's hard to look in the mirror and uh, and describe what you see. And uh, and they did a, a very good job of it. Um, they, you know, it's an ugly picture that they paint it, but it certainly was um, uh, was accurate. And you have consulted with the Japanese uh, parliament, the, the Diet, on this. Uh, what was your sense when you talked to the people on the panel? I was uh, over there in, in February, and, and we spoke for about three hours. And um, um, they were concerned as citizens. It, it, it wasn't about um, uh, the power of being a regulator, although clearly they had that too. You know, they have seen their country brought to its knees, and, um, and they really were uh, genuinely concerned and wanted to hear the truth. So the, the translator I was working with uh, said, okay, let's tell it like it is. Well, one of the things that, that came out in the, in the Japanese government report on the Fukushima nuclear disaster is uh, that they blame cultural conventions and uh, a cultural reluctance to question authority in Japan. Uh, was that ever discussed, or was, that, uh, was there a sense that that was a, a part of the problem? Well, the, the item I spent the most time on in that area was the, the issue of they knew for probably two decades that the plant could not withstand a tsunami of, uh, of the size that Mother Nature could likely throw at it. There were independent experts outside of this nuclear priesthood that were telling the Japanese that, uh, they, uh, that, that the plant was under-designed. Um, but it's a cloistered group, and um, uh, we talked about that, that uh, within the, um, uh, the, the agency that regulates in Tokyo Electric, they all agreed to sing one song, even though the experts were saying the opposite. Um, the, the Japanese, the diet members I spoke to wanted to hear that. Um, so the, the root cause of the accident occurring was the fact that they just didn't listen to anybody who was outside of their little club. There's a, the root cause of the, um, the issue not mitigated as fast enough is, is a separate cultural issue. Well, let's begin with the tsunami. and It's in an earthquake-prone region, prone to tsunamis. It's almost incomprehensible to me that the backup generators were not built up high because if you look at all of the all of the news footage and it's quite s- extraordinary the news footage of the of these uh, tsunami wave just wiping out this whole town and we've all seen these graphic pictures all of the people on you know second floor survived you know it's mm-hmm. it's pretty obvious that if you would have built them up a little bit they wouldn't have been uh, knocked out so readily it's actually not unique to fukushima um, there were uh, four different reactor sites. Uh, Fukushima Daiichi had six reactors. Uh, Daini had four. Uh, had four. Uh, Oka, Okinawa, Okagawa rather, had three, and Tokai had one. And they had between them 36 diesels. They lost 24 of them in the tsunami. So this could easily have been 14 nuclear plants in a meltdown and not of the, the three that we had. Uh, they were under-designed up and down the coast, not just at Fukushima Daiichi. Well, let me just remind you, audience, again, if I may, I'm speaking with Arnie Gunderson, a former nuclear industry senior vice president who has coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants 
in the United States and has consulted with the NRC, congressional and state legislatures and government agencies and officials in the US and abroad. And we're talking about the Japanese government's report today, issued today on the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Of course, it's a bit ironic that they should announce this scathing report about a kind of culture of collusion between the government bureaucracies and the nuclear industry. And on, on just on Sunday, the first reactor power reactor was restarted in the town of Ohai in the in Fukai prefecture. So here we are, on the one hand, condemning the way nuclear power is operated in, the, in Japan, and on the other hand, opening, restarting uh, power plants. That's frightening. And, uh, you know, the cultural issues don't get changed overnight. And in fact, they, they still have not separated out their regulator from the agency that it reports to, which is a promoter of nuclear power. So um, yeah, all of the cultural uh, issues identified in the Diet report are present right now. Um, they're not resolved, and they're years before they will be resolved. But yet the Japanese government just authorized the OI plant to, uh, to start up. Um, in light of this report, I think it certainly gives ammunition to the uh, public and to those people who are concerned I can't see how Ojai can be allowed to start up, uh, given the, the content of this report. But it's happened. It started on, on Sunday. Well, hopefully they'll change their mind. You know, even mm-hmm. now, there, were, there are seismic experts who are telling the, the, the uh, authorities within the Japanese government that there's six faults that run directly underneath the power plant. Some of them actually cut through the cooling water pipes that are designed to cool the plant in the event of an accident. Um, so the Japanese government has had ample warning of uh, the, the risk of, of Ojai, and yet they're still starting it up. Uh, I don't think anything has changed in Japan uh, despite this report. Well, there's also reports coming out, Arnie Gunderson, that the actual earthquake, not just the tsunami, but the earthquake damaged the reactors at Fukushima. You can actually see that. In, in Unit 4, uh, Unit 4 has buckled. Now, on the bottom, there's a, a, a bulb. And it's, it's about a two-inch bulb on a couple of the sides on the bottom, and it's one-third of the way up. And, uh, and, and structural engineers call that a, a, a first-mode Euler strut buckle, and it only happens from an earthquake. So here the, the Tokyo Electric acknowledging the building has has bowed, but yet at the same time they're saying that uh, uh, it withstood the the structural stresses that was placed upon. The, there's a the bigger story there is that if they admit that their seismic codes are wrong, it affects obviously every nuclear plant in Japan, but also every nuclear plant in the world, and it's an area where the industry wants to uh, wants to avoid scrutiny. Well, let's turn to the rest of the world, and particularly the United States, Arne Gunderson, since you're a former nuclear industry senior vice president who's coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants here in the United States. I know that you're very familiar with the boiling water reactor, the Westinghouse boiling water reactor, that several of which melted down at the Fukushima Daiichi plant following the earthquake and tsunami we have, of course, here south of us in Los Angeles, San Onofre, that's been closed now for four months because of excessive wear on pipes that were uh, just as they reinstalled a series of generators, and apparently they they stuffed a lot, a lot of extra steam pipes in to get a greater output, and those steam pipes had unusual and rapid wear, resulting in a, in a radiation leak. But... There's two things about that plant that are, that seem similar to Fukushima. One is, in, actually, Fukushima was a little inland. Uh, San Onofre is right on the bluff facing the Pacific Ocean. They built a 30-foot cement wall to prevent a tsunami from hitting the plant, but there's nothing to prevent the tsunami from going around the wall, which is only as long, uh, you know, only covers the length of the plant. So... That makes absolutely no sense, and and it's, the generators are right there. The diesel generators are right there in the open. So that's one question of how different are we here, and particularly at San Onofre, in terms of the of a tsunami problem. And two, the NRC a few months ago chastised 
the operators of the San Onofre plant for creating an atmosphere in which employees suffered retaliation if they reported safety concerns. So how different is that from what we're talking about with Japan, where you have a culture of collusion? Well, I'm an expert for Friends of the Earth on the, um, uh, on the, the San Onofre plant. Um, the, the, the wall in front of the plant is 30 feet high at low tide but it's only 14 feet high at the highest tide. So um, essentially a three-meter tsunami can, can swamp the wall. Um, but it's not about the diesels at San Onofre. It's about the water pumps that are right along the water. Um, if, if the tsunami were to hit those pumps, even though the diesels are in fact placed much higher than they are, um, if you don't have the water to cool the diesel, then you should, you'll lose the diesel anyway. So it's a, we call it service water. The pumps along the ocean are vulnerable to a tsunami, which will have the exact same effect. You won't be able to cool the, the, the plant. On the issue of whistleblowers, you know, I, I consult all over the country, and perhaps twice a year somebody will contact me with a concern that they don't feel management is adequately addressing. But I've been working on San Onofre now for three months, and I've had four people from San Onofre contact me with concerns. I've never seen that before. Now, I, I pass those concerns on to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission after, after making sure that the person is protected. But um, I, I have to agree, based on my personal experience, that uh, there's a cultural problem at San Onofre, um, and, and people are afraid to tell management the truth. Well, again, that has echoes of this Japanese report, doesn't it? I mean, I don't see the difference here in terms of, uh, of bureaucratic collusion. And you also, don't you have the same problem with the NRC that it's both a regulatory agency and a promoter of nuclear power? Well, let's get to the cultural collusion within San, uh, San Onofre first. Sure. You know, these steam generators that, that had the leaks were designed in 2006. And that's exactly at the high point of their whistleblower complaint uh, uh, period. They had 187 whistleblowers uh, at San Onofre. In a comparable period, the, the next worst plant had about five. So they had you know, literally 30 times more whistleblowers at San Onofre than any other plant. Um, and at the, at the time this generator was being designed, um, it's obvious they had, um, they had issues with their employees. So moving on to the NRC, the NRC is a captured regulator. The, um, uh, this example just recently where the industry, nuclear industry, put pressure on the chairman of the Nuclear and, uh, Regulatory Commission and dragged him in front of Congress. And, and the guy resigned. He, and all he was was a regulator trying to regulate. But the industry didn't like that. And, um, and through congressional pressure, um, was able to get him thrown out. So these problems um, start at the top. They start at Congress. You know, both Democrat and Republican, they um, they are basically pro-nuclear, and that pressure then filters down on the commission. There hasn't been a commissioner in the last 20 years that hasn't been vetted and approved by NEI, which is the trade organization for nuclear power. But in the case of Gregory Jasko, who resigned under pressure, he apparently was trying to take the lessons of Fukushima into account. And the nuclear industry in this country simply wanted to pretend that uh, Fukushima didn't happen. That's right. I met with uh, Chairman Jasko twice in the last couple of months on San Onofre issues. And uh, I can assure you he, is, he, he doesn't want to knee-jerk reaction show the plant down. But he wants to apply the law when the law is applicable. And his other commissioners um, desperately want to keep these plants running, even if it means bending the law or ignoring the law. Now, uh, Chairman Yasko, on the, on the issue of the Fukushima modifications, was adamant that, um, that these modifications need to be made promptly um, and thoroughly, and um, uh, the industry needs to take them seriously. But yet his his fellow members of the commission, and there's five of them, um, voted them down and delayed um, these decisions and also inserted themselves into the process where if the staff came forward with a concern, the commission reserves the right to overthrow its own staff. 
So they, this commission, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the leader of which, uh, the head of which, Greg Jasko, was pressured out, and the White House have uh, put up a, a woman, right? I can't quite remember, uh, remember her name to replace him. I don't know whether she's going to be any better. But one of the bizarre things about what they complained about Jasko was that he didn't vote with everybody. And the reason he didn't vote with him with everybody was that he was actually voting for safety and the rest of them weren't. I mean, it's it's an amazing thing that they could play roulette with the American people with this evidence that, uh, of what happened in Japan. And now what's happening in San Onofre? Because that wasn't a tsunami. That That was just something was wrong with the way they installed those new steam generators and added the extra pipes. And yet the NRC and Daryl Issa, the congressman from the district, are putting pressure to restart that, that reactor when it's clearly not safe. No, I think you're right. The um, I've been reviewing lots of reports in the last month, and um, um, it's amazing to me um, the NRC said they were going to do a root cause analysis. And that means getting to the bottom of the problem at San Onofre. And uh, it's crystal clear to me they didn't, um, and nor did the people at San Onofre. Um, they dug um, a little bit, and then when it got, uh, got to an area they didn't want to go in, they literally stopped analyzing, um, and the NRC let them get away with it. it I was down um, two weeks ago at a, a meeting down there with the uh, um, the exit meeting of the augmented inspection team. Anyway, the NRC was basically telling what they found. And they found that San Onofre deliberately ignored its vibration monitors. They could hear those pipes rattling, and they chose to do nothing about it um, until the pipes broke. That was one of the one of the findings. The other finding was that they had a 400% error in the computer codes. And um, they didn't detect it for six years. So that tells me there's a gross quality assurance breakdown and a gross breakdown in the commitment to safety. You know, when you hear things rattling around in your car engine, you pull over to the side of the road. You don't wait till you blow a, a piston um, before you stop. Well... Arnie Gunderson, uh, you know, we, we started out talking about the Japanese government's report came out today on the Fukushima accident saying it was a profoundly man-made disaster and uh, that it should have been foreseen and prevented and its effects could have been mitigated by more a more effective human response. It was held up as an example here to America's nuclear industry. The head of the NRC got fired because he tried to retrofit American plants, all of which have this, a lot of which have the same uh, uh, boiling water reactor that melted down in Japan. He got forced out because he was trying to do his job and trying to follow the extraordinarily dangerous precedents that uh, Japan have shown us. And now we have a, an example right near where I'm speaking to you from of a nuclear plant that has serious problems, yet the same pressure to open them. So can you explain to me this, the mentality of why this institution or this industry is so willing to risk American lives? Well, years ago, um, someone coined it as a, as a nuclear priesthood. And um, you, you either buy into the orthodoxy or you're, uh, um, you're excluded from, from the process. And, and I think that's, uh, that's at the root of it. Um, this is uh, not um, um, about science. These people are committed on a, uh, as an orthodoxy to nuclear power. Um, and, you know, it doesn't stop in the United States. It goes into the, uh, the IAEA, the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency. Um, its charter is to promote nuclear power. But yet you'll constantly hear, well, the IAEA says that Fukushima is safe. So the same problems we have in Japan and the United States are also in the International Atomic Energy Agency as well. So I, I, I don't see uh, an easy way out of this because there's um, so much money on, um, on the side of the argument to keep these plants running. Um, I think at the end of the day it, boil, it boils down to money, though, and um, as alternatives come along that are cheaper, um, these plants will um, will stop operating. There's an excellent Associated Press piece out just today 
about how San Onofre may never start up because the money doesn't work. The cost to fix is not worth the cost of replacing them with, uh, with alternative power sources. I think Wall Street at the end of the day will make the decision that the, uh, uh, that the orthodoxy doesn't want made. Just in closing, um, Arne Gunderson, the uh, Germans have shut down uh, their nuclear power and they're getting out of, out of nuclear power altogether and then they're, they're in the, they are in the midst of replacing it uh, uh, with um, wind and solar and they don't have, uh, uh, you know, they're in northern climate with a lot of cloud, not a lot of sun. Um, so the Germans are, uh, have, have, as a result, by the way, of Fukushima, that was one of the things that propelled uh, the German government into it, into it, into that, pro- propelled the German government into that decision. Now, Japan, the prime minister, in defending the opening of these, uh, uh, restarting of these reactors that were shut down since Fukushima, he says that, uh, that they've got, you know, they've basically got no cho- choice. Uh, it's essential for their economy. Why can't the Japanese make the transition the Germans made? Well, and actually, Japan has the highest industrial power costs in the world, even with the nuclear power plants. They have essentially nine cabals of uh, nuclear power generators, and there's no downward pressure on rates for them. Um, the, the difference is the, uh, the, the Germans shut down any plant that was built before 1978 immediately, and then they're winnowing their way off of the other oh, dozen or so over the next 10 years. Um, the Japanese are, um, uh, are, are going cold turkey. Um, they can make it 10 months out of the year for sure without the nuclear plants. And the question is, um, will they be able to get through the, uh, the summer? The citizens are saying, we'll turn off our air conditioners. We don't want the risk. But the politicians are saying... Um, if we shut these plants down for an entire summer and our citizens get through, then, oh, my God, we can actually do without nuclear power. I don't think they want to uh, fa- face that eventuality. But the, the citizens of Japan, you know, this, this all began with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and uh, they're looking at it as bookends on the shelf. So you had Hiroshima and Nagasaki on one end and Fukushima on the other, and, and, and they want it over. Yet we're seeing... Um, the government totally resistant to the pressure of um, of citizens and still feeling the pressure from the uh, the nuclear industry. Well, uh, Arnie Gunderson, I thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me. Again, I've been speaking with Arnie Gunderson, who's a former nuclear industry senior vice president who has coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants here in the United States. He's currently chief engineer at Fairwinds Associates and an independent consultant on nuclear and radiation issues to the NRC, congressional and state legislatures and government agencies and officials in the United States and abroad.